Hello and welcome to Show Studio. This morning we will be discussing the Eckhaus Lauter Autumn Winter 18 show that happened last night in Bushwick. I'm joined by a remarkable set of panellists. So before we dive in and discuss the cult of community and what Eckhaus Lauter are doing this season, I will let my wonderful set of panellists introduce themselves, starting with you, Anastasia. Hi, I'm Anastasia and I'm a curator and a writer contributing to various titles, including Days, the ID, Zero Fits to See and a few others. Hey, I'm Patrick Muller, I'm a graphic designer working for Maria Marie in Cologne. I'm Jennifer Williams Baffo, I'm a lecturer at Central St. Martins and Royal College of Art. I'm Josie Hall and I'm senior fashion assistant at British Vogue. And I'm Laura Johnson Miller, I'm featured editor at Show Studio. Thank you guys, it's really exciting to have everyone here this morning. I want to start a bit about talking about Eckhouse Artists in general a little bit, because I think what's really interesting about the brand is the way that they market themselves. And so I really want to start with you, Anastasia. I'm going to pick on you because I, you've written quite extensively about Eckhouse Artists as a brand. And I want to ask you why you think their marketing campaigns and the way that they portray themselves in the media is so strong. I think it's a really interesting case with them uh, because when you look at the shows or the clothes or the images they put out, it's always like something you can't quite pin down. Like, what is it which attracts you? What is it you like about it? There's always something which is kind of in between the lines. And I think it really comes through in uh, a lot of the collaborations uh, with uh, filmmakers, artists, photographers. Um, so it's not just, I think it's just basically not just the product, but the whole world around it and the community they tap into, which is great, which creates a little bit of this myth, I think, which really works. But in terms of imagery, I don't know, I guess it's just a very unconventional approach um, in terms of casting, in terms of who they choose to collaborate with. Like, I'm sure you've all seen the films um, they put out. I'm not sure if they put, put one out this time, but before that, it was like every six months they yeah. work with um, Alexa Karolinski, who's a, who lives in LA, who's a great filmmaker. So they always have this uh, strange sort of like, a, either like a cult or like a weird party or it's like, so basically an additional story. And I think stories people, but people really want to be part, you know, want to buy into, but also want to be part of just as a, just, just an experience. Yeah. Of course, one thing that is so remarkable about what they do is they use fashion film quite a lot. Obviously, at Show Studio, the home of fashion film, we're very big pioneers of that. And I think what Eckhart started to do very cleverly is that they mix all of these different mediums. And obviously, Anastasia, I want to pick up on something you said is about the casting. Mm -hmm. And I think that this cult thing that they bring in is so key in that. And I wonder why it is that we think that the way that Eckhaus Lata casts is something that people are so drawn to. Jennifer, I wonder, what do you think? I think what's going on at the moment, and something we've been talking about a lot at, at um, the college, is there's this kind of humanistic approach. Mm. People are beginning, because of what's going on socially, mm. um, politically as well, I think people are now thinking, look, we need to be a little bit more together. And it's not this sort of controlled kind of look anymore. Mm. It's funny because we were discussing it earlier. There is, a, there, there is this sort of particular type of person that they pick. But to me, I think people look real. Mm. It's like someone you would see walking down the street. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, it's like you, you see someone like, you know, they look really familiar. And I think that's kind of important now in fashion it, that we're sort of seeing people that kind of look like us, mm. that represent us, whatever, you know, whatever background you come mm. from. Anastasia, you said that it was maybe something that you couldn't put your finger on. Do you think it's this idea that Jennifer's talking about? Do you think what you can't put your f finger on about Eckhaus Lata is inclusivity? I think definitely, definitely part of it because if, if you look at, um, let's say, other brands which generate a lot of uh, not just hype but actually genuine interest um, are all about this idea of a group or a community, let's say like Telfar uh, or Hudbaya, which like is more like a club crowd, right? Or, um, even with Man, actually, a few years ago, it was all about kind of a group of friends, but for them it was more about, you know, us against them, maybe, while for Carlos Lata it's just like us, which is very, it's very broad, so you, you like can relate to it really easily because it's, it, it makes you part of it, but it doesn't cut out other people, which I think is a great thing, particularly to exist in the US at the moment in the whole political situation. Patrick, you worked on the AMAG for Eckhaus Lata, which very much focused on all of their community coming together. They invited a lot of different people. Did you feel that sense of inclusivity? And how was it to work with them for that magazine? 
Mm, I have the feeling that they're very generous in their approach because mm. they they give people space and not and they were reaching out. It's not only people they know. I think they asked people. There's that uh, art critic from the New York Times, and I don't know if they if they knew her before, mm. but I think they reached out for the mm. magazine and used that opportunity to get in touch with them, mm. and they want to know about them and let them do what they want to do and give them space to create something and not saying. Um, I think I think it's bit. It's a good free open space. Mm. There's a generosity in spirit, I think. I think it would be easy as well to keep romanticizing it in this way, but I, want to, I wonder as well if maybe we should look at that in a bit of a, it's a clever thing to do. It's quite canny, this casting, to bring all these different people in. It keeps people interested. What do you think? I think it's a super important thing for all these young designers to do. I think the casting that it has sort of been up until now, with some exceptions of, you know, 16-year-old girls, basically coat hangers that just kind of don't really know what's going on and they're going from show to show and, you know, it's all, it's, I don't think that's representing fashion very well and it almost seems super old-fashioned now mm. to do that and it's just, it's much more exciting and I think for the people to be able to relate to the clothes and, yeah, it makes them feel like you could be accepted in that in those, pieces, in those pieces of clothing and you can wear them, you can be that person. Whereas when you see it on this kind of extremely young, beautiful, but unrelatable mm. character, it's just, it seems so far away almost and like not. I think it's easy to see this being done in other brands, particularly in London, you know, people invite people that they're inspired by or people who they're interested in to walk in their shows. And what I think is so interesting about what I can start to do is that all of their references appear to continue in the cast of their shows. For example, uh, mod, uh, artists like Michael Lee and Suzanne um, Cianciolo and uh, Alexandra Marzella, they're all people who sort of inspired and influenced them and they're in their shows too. And, you know, their casting originally pioneered people like Juliana Huxtable and Harry Neff. And so it does create this overall overarching aesthetic that remains very strong. And I wonder if that's something that's sustainable and whether that's something that is going to become their pull. Is that the main focus of that Castlata? I would say that it's a big focus. I think, I think it's just something that people are really excited about and mm. I know diversity is like such a... Buzzword. Buzzword <laughs> at the moment. I almost can't bring myself to say it <laughs> so much. But that, like everyone talks about it and not everyone is acting on it at all mm -hmm. and also and then sometimes when they are acting on it it seems too forced and almost like contrived and just sort of on, on purpose for the sake of it but this is something that they've always been from day one doing and just like from all ages races sizes and that's just like exciting it doesn't seem like all of a sudden they're jumping on this bandwagon that quite a lot of people are you Jennifer know. you're nodding I am because I'm sort of thinking about <laughs> this is going to sound funny when I say this but like this is new, uh, was it, no, I wouldn't say it's new school Benetton, but it's like all Benetton. <laughs> but it's, I think yeah. this is done in the right way. It, you use the right word, you said it's not contrived. Um, it feels real. Um, it feels like something that people want to get on board with. Um, even just looking at the clothes, everyone looks comfortable. They don't look uncomfortable mm. wearing them. So yeah, I do, I do kind of mm. agree. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about the clothes, because I think it is easy to get bogged down with all the things behind the clothes. But what do we think about Eckhazata's designs? I actually wanted to add on a pr previous point I'm about sure. the um, casting and the whole like approach to it. I'm wondering how much is it gonna like spread in like more mainstream fashion and like how soon it's gonna happen and because it's definitely happening. Like let's say when obviously like Helmut Lang, like it's a major major brand, but it's obviously Shane from Hood Bear. So he brought that uh, that idea of um, kind of doing his own like crowd as a um, so that's definitely going to make, make a change. And um, when I actually was uh, doing my reports for Milan Men's for Show Studio, <laughs> I actually realized that it's like so, it, it, got, it changed so much. It got like, I mean, obviously not all the brands, but brands which want to look more than... So you are feeling a real, real shift in the diversity. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously in men's where it's like not so much in the body type, obviously, because it's really like <laughs> um, standard. But like, yeah, in terms of just types and like racial diversity. And again, not all the brands obviously, but a few, two or three were like incredibly diverse and that's very interesting to see. So I guess that's like, we have to thank 
brands. I get cow slaughtered for that, really. And I think yeah. it's so interesting that you mentioned different body types, and I do want to step mm. back to the clothes, because I think what they do so well is design for different body types. And it's not that each design is specifically for that coat hanger silhouette. Mm. But they're, they're, sorry, they're also <laughs> like, um, I mean, I don't know if it gender neutral, gender free. Basically, in terms of the cut, their stuff is often not cut specifically for like a male mm. or female body, right? So that was in, because I was reading about them a bit before, and I think that was actually the challenge for them to, for example, if you sell denim, right? You have to be you have to be known for actually making the right cut, like gender, gender kind of thing. So that's interesting how it can become both your like work for your benefit, mm. but also become a bit of a challenge. Your USP you... and your downfall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting, like, for example, I think in the, this collection, they've put someone who's larger in a like, tight knit dress, which is just interesting, I think, rather than trying to hide, as you know, not this collection, but this the is latest the previous collection. collection. Yeah. This is spring, summer 18. Um, and it's just, it's just nice to see that. It's like, rather than, you know, oh, we've, chosen someone outside the normal standards of model sizes and hid it, it's like embracing it and using all these different body shapes to kind of create something interesting with the way the clothes hang. And this is one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about Ek Hazard to this brand this season and it is because I think this, when this um, collection showed last season people were very excited about this, people did feel very inspired and I felt like I read some, a lot of criticism that said Eckhaus Lata is one of the only interesting brands in New York. I wonder what my panelists think of that. Um, I love the fact that, you know, again, talking about this humanist approach, that they use lots of natural fabrics, um, they recycle a lot. I think that's, um, um, as much as we, you know, it's been happening quite a bit, I think we're going to continue seeing that. Um, again, at college, a lot of our students talk about this a lot, how they can sort of recycle things, how they can sort of think about not just one type of person, but managing that, to me, my mind is sort of thinking, how are they managing their production? Because that's, that's huge to sort of deal with. When you're dealing with a particular type of size, you know, a standard 10, 12, whatever, that's easy to manage. But if you've got quite a big ratio of sizes, my mindset is sort of thinking, how are they managing their production? That must be really kind of... Mm having a knock-on effect on their, um, their cash flow of course. business background. So I'm interested in that. And what would you say to them? How, how would you imagine a way to counteract that would be? Um, again, it's small run. You've got to kind of test it out. You can see from their progression, look at the clothes from the beginning up until now, that they're sort of testing things out. Um, I had a look on their website and they did have a lot of discounts. <laughs> But I guess they're sort of, sort of, again, they're sort of looking at that. How is that sort of developing? How are they going to kind of plan the next mm. range? Um, yeah. Well, I think this point is exactly where I'd like to lead to, to have a look at the current collection. Because as I think we'll see, I think it's clear that what they are doing now is trying to move into a bit more of a, you know, a sustainable brand and look a bit at their business model. So let's have a look at the clothes that they presented last night and see what we think. So immediately, I have to say, immediately again, I'm struck by the casting. Mm -hmm. um, the third look is worn by Sophie, who's quite a well-known singer. She's transgender, she's very beautiful and very powerful. And as we see here, this, the fifth look is worn by a um, very well-known art collector and critic, Thea Westenwaga. She's, so she, you know, modeling as an older lady. It's quite wonderful to see. So I'm immediately, again, struck by this. And the collection, I think, initially seems a little different, perhaps, mm. from what we've seen before. Josie, I think you mentioned you yeah. you were quite interested in that. I, yeah, I like the beginning of it. I think it seems a lot more sort of polished and complete and almost like higher and mm. fashion than sometimes in the past where it can feel, even though that's their angle on things, like it can feel slightly unfinished mm. or like, Crafty. Crafty, touching on the student kind mm. of vibe still. But, um, you know, it seems like they're kind of, like, pushing themselves further and further and things seem, like, with the tailoring and that kind of silky dress, mm. it just looks m sort of a bit more fine-tuned and well-made, <laughs> yeah. basically. Well, they've mentioned they're trying to look a bit more at shapes and tailoring. I think it really shows in this collection. 
to me, it's kind of this is one of the show which, when you look at pictures, you just think, I wish I was, uh, I wish I were there. So actually, she, the way it moves, and also you like to see it close up, yeah. the way it like works on skin because it's like mm. so like tactile. Even from like a still image, you can see that it's a lot about texture and the movement and. Yeah, I think there's great about them, really. Patrick, you were at the show last season. Do you think that there's a difference in the way you were seeing that last year and, and last season and then looking at it on the screen? Mm, I think it looks quite similar to the last collection. It's the mm. same location they used the mm. last time. Oh, yeah, they showed in Bushwick. But and what was the venue like? Mm, it's some industrial space, I think. Mm. It looks like they, they redid the floor, so mm -hmm. it's something they rent out mm. for these kind of things. It looks very bright and airy, this mm. space. It kind of looks like it lets the garments sort of breathe, in a sense. Yeah, they have a big courtyard in the back, mm. and they came from the courtyard. I think they were mingling there, mm. and then you could go back with the models back there. But I think the casting is very different this time. Yes, there are some and, quite mm. noticeable omissions mm. from the casting people who walk quite regularly for them. Like, uh, Michael Bailey Gates walked last season, and Alexandra Marcella is not present in the casting. But Paloma here, as look, in look 18, she walked for them for years, and I think she's the model who you mentioned was wearing the tight-knit dress in the last season, and they've put her again in this sort of quite sensual, tight-knit, which is quite beautiful. I want to just draw attention to the shoes as well, which I'm not sure if you can see here, but there's a new collaboration that they've done, in fact, Ecosato have put their models in heels, which mm. is quite interesting. You know, they've done a lot of collaborations with Camper, mm. and they kind of often pioneer those quite comfortable shoes. I wonder what you think about this, you know, even with this sort of cut out, quite tight yellow dress with slashes and slits, to put a model in heels seems much more mature. But it's mature. like this ultra sexy thing is really in right now, right? But this is this kind of like very tight stuff and like slightly fetish and like lots of yeah high heels again. Um, I feel like it's been ha happening quite a bit, right? Like yeah, Helmut Lang obviously, but um, I don't quite remember. I think Moschino did like very sexy collection. So that's actually quite quite interesting. How do you do it in a sort of empathetic way? Let's say it like that because like. Like, aggressive sex appeal is a weird topic, right? Particularly in the current political <laughs> climate, right? And do you think um, that's a positive thing, the way that they're doing, working I with think sex? it is, because it's nice, to, it's nice to show that it can be done the way that you feel comfortable about it, and it's kind of um, liberating as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know, it's an interesting point, actually. I didn't really notice before you said that it's a very, like, classic kind of look, you know, the dress and the heel. <laughs> No, really. Mm. Again, maybe they're trying to like uh, branch out into something, experiment um, a bit. Well, I'm always I'm always drawn by Eckhart Tolle and the way that their pieces often look quite um, sort of outre, but their styling is actually often very minimal. Josie, you have come from a styling background a bit, so I want to pick on you a bit there. What, how effective do you think that styling is? I think the styling is nice. I mean. It is, the pieces are quite minimal in themselves, so there's obviously not like, whereas some shows have scarves. Compared to Venture, you know. for example, you know, the pile on effect seems yeah, to be Yeah, I think, I think this keeps it like fresh and you can, it's not overdoing it and you can get, you get what they're saying really with it. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it, uh, And harking back a bit to Anastasia's point, I think, this minimal styling perhaps shows a lot more skin mm. than you'd maybe expect. And it is this kind of nod to sexuality in every look and power. Quite LA, I suppose, as well, right? Because... Yeah. What do you think? To, I mean, I don't know. To me, it's just, uh, yeah, the, and the colours too. Like, every time I look at this stuff, I'm like, I like it. And I don't understand why is that I like it, mm. which because it, there's every reason to actually dislike it in the way, like the color combination and stuff, because, but I think that's, that's basically what works, even if it's like not the shapes or colors you'd conventionally be into, somehow it's like, just works just right, at least to me it does. Mm -hmm. Even though, I don't know, sometimes I, I wouldn't probably imagine myself wearing it, but actually no, I could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, it's quite 80s, which, you know, again, was around the time of a lot of power and looking at the cuts and the sort of the, the kind of the shapes of the shoulders, etc. 
And you were talking, of, you mentioned sex, so, mm -hmm. which, you know, I think they're trying to be a lot more, um, a lot more, I guess, adult about things, mm. but not in a, a, a childish sort of way. Um, I know we're going to come on to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, sex does sell. Mm. Um, but I think this is a re really classy collection. I'm I think there's some very classy touches as well. I'm quite interested by these gloves. Mm. In fact, at the Ralph Simmons show, the men were wearing gloves. I think maybe perhaps gloves are the piece to invest in this season. <laughs> but I think the gloves do also denote something that's quite key to what Eckhart started to do and, and very key to this collection, which is it's about, about power and confidence. And it's not necessarily, you know, I mean, you mentioned it, but it doesn't feel necessarily like power woman confidence, mm. but simply a confidence and a sense of power in respect for individuality. It doesn't feel that aggressive, but more, I think they did these gloves too, mm -hmm. and, and the mm -hmm. sock shoes and stuff like that, and that's a very aggressive gesture, and here it's more like, uh, they're wearing these Chanel tweed mm. knitwear, mm. Eckhart's lighter version of that, and it's more play playful. Mm. Approach, yes, uh, yeah. I think with this, it does still feel quite sort of 90s and like effortless, like going back to the styling, it's mm. just, you know, like they're not trying too hard to be anything, they're just kind of, putting out their character and could we go back to the earlier looks please so I think um, I think that I feel a bit that the collection is slightly divided into these six early looks and then the rest of the show and I feel like a lot of what we're looking at now with the these colors and these knits I feel like they are familiar and they're very much the codes of Eckhaus Lata but I really want to talk a bit more about these first six looks because they feel distinct to me and I wonder if you agree with that or or not maybe this is their sort of first statement putting it out there saying this is we are moving forward slightly with the tailoring and it just looks more beautiful almost than I wonder what the price point for these pieces are because I've I would imagine that the price point for these six looks would be a bit higher yeah. than the others. And you I can think tell because of the tailoring that's gone into yeah. it and the thought. I mean, even the dress that's bias cut, the mm -hmm. silk one. So yeah, definitely it's going to be a higher price point. I would be interested to know what fabrics they're using as mm -hmm. well. And also it's very interesting the way that they've cut those jeans using the different fabrics. And again, I'd want to know, I guess mm -hmm. I'll have to have a look that up, what, the, what kind of fabric they've mm -hmm. used there, because that's quite interesting the way they sort of mix that up. Is, Is any of it leather? I think there is some denim. leather in the later looks, but I'm not sure about those trousers. I'd be interested to know. I wonder if we have any close-ups, we could get a better idea of the textures that are being used. Oh yeah, look there. Wow. See, if you looked at that picture, number one, mm. you wouldn't say at Cow's Latter, I think. No, I agree. You wouldn't. But, that's but it's nice. Yeah, the question <laughs> for me is like, because they have this really distinct style and distinct pieces, but like, how much can you grow and be faithful? Basically, how much can you use it as your thing and mm. not so people don't get bored of you and so they invest progressively more and more money mm. into this stuff. So I don't know. That's pretty interesting because that involves a lot of challenges and why you take your brand and how and do you like take it slowly or do you like try to progress fast? Are you looking for like an investor, do you want to, I don't know, so yeah, it's, it, it, because how old are they, how old is the brand now? This is their 16th collection. Yeah, so it's, it's still a young brand, but it's, uh, there's probably this like point when it, mm. you have to decide basically which way you're. Well, I think that's quite key in. about this collection is it's quite obvious that this is Eckhaus Lata a bit in flux. Mm. I think these first six looks arguably are a nod to exactly what you're saying. It's not showing people that they can be new and they can develop and they can do new things and investors perhaps should take them seriously. But at the same time, not forgetting their backgrounds and where they come from and what they're doing and what makes them happy is, you know, these playful, inspiring pieces of clothing that you don't know why they work quite, but they do. And I think what they, these last pieces show as well is that Eckhart Lata I think perhaps Nick Knight said this at one point. But he said that um, Eckhart Lata, when he spoke to them, couldn't quite tell whether they were artists who'd come into fashion because it seemed like the way that they were best at expressing themselves 
or, or whether fashion was something that they really wanted to pursue. And I think that's quite interesting in what they're doing. And I think with this collection, they're showing that they want to be taken seriously as designers. Mm -hmm. And the first six looks are really pieces of design. After filling the show before, last show felt like some kind of end point, some best of thing. And the casting, they had all these creative people who are around them in that show, which is missing now. And I think you can, I don't know, maybe it was working on the A magazine, but it mm -hmm. felt like they were running a magazine. They pulling all these mm -hmm. creators into their world and letting them want to do projects with them. It's not that they are ambassadors and they're just wearing the clothes on the street and they get photographed or stuff mm -hmm. like that. But it's like they, they want to branch out with these people, they want to work with them. And now it feels more, more fashion in mm -hmm. a professional sense. And it's not like we want to work with artists, they want to be with our friends and do stuff like that. It's like so now they're moving forward in the industry with a bit more gusto. Perhaps that was something that was happening with their 15th collection, it was more of a retrospective look and then moving forward. So what do we think, at Kals where do we think they will go and move forward? Do we think that they'll expand more? Is it possible for them to do that? I think that's always possible, somehow. I think they've probably still got quite a way to go. Mm. They're still considered the, the fresh, young, cool kids on the block. And do you think that's helpful? What, to have that? To be considered addition. young and fresh and cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's a big thing. I'd say there's like four brands out there probably that are four or five that are doing that. And with the young people these days with things like Instagram, everyone mm. you know can latch onto it and feel like they're part of it. And otherwise, then what's the whole point really? I know you're gonna hate <laughs> me for asking this question. What? But is Vogue interested in Eckhaus Latte? The new Vogue? Well, I don't think I can say. I don't know. <laughs> I'm brands, interested. Brands like Eck Hasata, do you think that, you know, it's interesting that they're in New York and people like us are talking about them? I mean, all, it, something of course, like, in. all the editors are there at the show, but it's not, it's not like they're being... Spotlighted. Not, not I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but why is that? Why are we so keen on pioneering a brand like this? I know my, my reasons, but I'm really keen on hearing what you guys think. I think it's quite interesting that it, com it comes out of New York, which is um, kind of known. New York Fashion Week is known to be like more commercial. Um, like London always has the most like, yeah, everybody's yeah. nodding really happily. <laughs> always has um, has like the most sort of creative, odd, crazy stuff like Charles Jeffrey, let's say, or brands like this. Um, but New York hardly ever has it, but it has, yeah, it has a cow slot, it has Telfar, which are and like food by air. so like those are probably three which off white yeah off white but off white is a bit like it it's gone a bit it's not as like yeah grass, it doesn't feel as grassroots anymore yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as this stuff feels yeah i'm interested in this idea that we we often group these brands together so at Casla to yeah. and i think for Kara often sort of lumped into this and we were talking about this quite a lot yesterday on our Telfar panel. And I was saying that I, I don't think that's something that necessarily we do in London. Mm. We don't really group these young brands together so much as, it, as is happening in New York. And I wonder, is that because, you know, eclectic brands are less common in New York? Or I would we're just a bit removed? What do you mean we don't group them in London? I think, I think there are probably obvious groups of young designers. Do you think? Like we have our group mm. of young designers. Specifically? Um, people like Charles Jeffrey or Molly or uh, all that, that kind I feel of age like the and then I guess there's the... I feel like the difference is that we're not generation. talking about designers like Charles Jeffrey or Molly Goddard in a separate way to who, when we're talking about more established designers on the mm -hmm. British schedule, yeah. like you know perhaps Burberry and Christopher Kane, we're talking about them simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think the difference with a lot of what the commercial, bigger commercial brands in New York are doing is talked, spoken about separately. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been, is evident, and we mentioned this yesterday, the CFDA have decided to create a specific season for non-binary and non-gender specific brands. And Eckhart Sata and Telfar have been, in, oh well, I'm not sure, but presumably will be included in this. And I think that that's not something that is happening in Britain. Do we think there's a difference in the, in the climate between these two cities that makes that distinction? Maybe it's the nature of like, I don't know about the industry as a whole, but maybe as a, 
Yeah, the way it's spoken about, like the media attitude to stuff, I don't know, because the UK obviously has a tradition of, you know, have, having magazines like Days and AD and the whole, which, and platforms like Show Studio, which like, <laughs> A massively changed the way we talk about fashion as something which comes from the street, something which talks about ideas and concepts which are far beyond fashion as just clothes and like aspirational beauty and stuff. So like here it's like normal for us to speak about all that, but I don't know if like if it's like this in New York. Because of course when they talk about let's say art, contemporary art, um, which New York is so known about this this is how we speak about it. And maybe the affiliations of these brands have like both Cars Art and Telfar, let's say. The affiliations they have with contemporary art world put them a little bit apart from like my mainstream fashion stuff. That's yeah. interesting that you think the distinction is their, their art pull. Jennifer, what do you think? I want to kind of go back to one of the things mm. that you were asking, where are they sure. going? Um, are they going to go into things like licensing? So maybe doing like accessories, perfume, that's where they're going to sort of develop and make money. But the thing is, we don't want them to lose the essence of how beautiful they are in terms of what they're doing with their aesthetic. So I think that's important because if they get it wrong, then they could go. Pfft. And I think it would be great to see that they're doing it, obviously, with the collaborations with Camper, so doing it slowly and growing. But I think obviously everyone knows that's where you make your money with the with the makeup, the accessories. The, so will they go that route? That's what I'm interested in seeing. So would you like to see perhaps more collaborations, smaller ways Maybe. to buy into the economy? Yeah, smaller collaborations. I, I don't want it to grow too fast, otherwise we're going to lose that essence. We don't want it to become too corporate. Um, but again, on the other hand, you can see they're trying to be a little bit more, you know, taking care of what they're doing and making sure that they're taken seriously in terms of their aesthetic. <laughs> just, I'm looking at you because you're doing so nodding and I thought oh. you had a moment that you wanted to No, no, I just agree. It's very easy mm. to lose the lose sight for these people, like for these designers, it's easy to maybe give in to the money mm. or, you know, and, and then actually you lose all sense of where they began. But um, it is important for people to make money, of course, mm. and um, hopefully there are ways that they can do it through selling their clothes and making more commercial pieces um, that pe people can buy and, yeah, perhaps, you know. I think we've spoken <laughs> quite quite broadly about Eckhart's art, but I want to leap, leap back to the very beginning when Anastasia was saying that she still can't quite put her finger on what it is that they do and what it is that's appealing. And I do just want, you know, been talking about them for a while now. What what do we think it is that is so key to the brand? Okay, I'm really sorry. I want to get back to the perfume, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep no, thinking, no, no, everyone. I, no, <laughs> no, my mind the, the perfume. I yeah. think they, they did a scent once with Bjorn and Melgaard. I think like you have. They did. They did a collaboration with yeah, on yeah. that art. Yeah. I really like that. And I think they could come up with something like that with an interesting collaboration. Yeah. I think it's not very mainstream with Bjorn and Melgaard, but it kind of could work in perfume and do a big campaign with interesting images. I think, I think you're right. And I think the smart work. thing about what they did with that was that they did what you're saying, which is kind of this thing to buy and do. But being very at house after, they subverted it. And so to work with an artist like Bjorn and Melgaard, they twisted that idea of just like a commercial buy-in. I think it's good a perfume ad, it's a big thing, it has a big name on it. And yes, it's this, a big yeah. portrait of someone. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a nice genre to work with. <laughs> and again, it brings us back to our, in my initial opening question, which is why their imagery is so strong. I mean, what is it about this that is so strong? It's so the opposite of your, like, conventional perfume advert. There's always got such a, all perfume ads have, you know, that's completely separate to the brand, usually, and it's all glamorous and always the same, really. But this is just the total opposite. I love the guy's um, tan line as well. Mm. Oh, yeah, I didn't notice that. <laughs> it's a sense of humour with it. Yeah. Um, in, you know, with other campaigns, it's like high gloss, as you were saying, it's like high gloss and high. But it's not, it looks... Mm. He's sniffing poppers, really. Yeah. And the sense of humour is inherent in everything they do. If we look at the other campaign that I'm yeah. very interested in, the uh, campaign of real people having sex in their clothes, it's, it goes back to exactly what you were saying, Jennifer. It's very human, it's very real, but it really captures the essence of that brand. It's, you know, it's, it's sexy without being slutty. Yeah. 
Also, people are being really safe these days with everything that's going on in the industry. Um, and so it's nice to see that there are still people like pushing the boundaries yeah. and doing something different and not like taking everyone's mm. like, taking it all too seriously, basically. Mm. I mean, this campaign got a lot of people talking. It was a lot of juices flowing in many different ways we partnered on. <laughs> but it really did. It really created a bit of a stir. But even their most recent campaign for their denim brand, it still has that very unique pull and their very unique here, you can see it on the screen now. It's humorous. And it, it's distinctly them. This carnivalesque makeup with these very tight, kind of sexy <laughs> jeans. I guess you just have to think, these days I have, I have a feeling it's so much fashion imagery out there every season, every day. There's like new stuff. So you really have to think about how do you do it differently, mm -hmm. but also how do you still show your product? So it's like, I suppose, yeah, that's the key. It's like subversive, but it's also not taking yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. so I guess that appeals to people. So. And I think what it is, is that it's, it's true to who they are. Mike and Zoe, they're, you know, it's about intimacy and being close. And all the people they bring in are people that they're close to and people that they like and laugh with and respect and perhaps to answer my question that nobody wanted to answer, that's the key and that's the pull. And it's not that you look at the show and you look at all the people and you can count the characters, but it's that each of those people is important to them. I think also they've got that sort of anti-establishment thing still, which mm. people always love. Otherwise it will get a bit boring. How long will that last? It's like, it's like authenticity, right? The, everybody's like crazy about something authentic and it often comes in really odd um, shapes these days. Like, for instance, when everybody was so east, into Eastern Europe or something, that was perceived as something like from the fringes. And, right, right. But then it become quite like, a bit of a caricature itself quite quickly. So with them, I guess it's that like capability of having this authenticity somehow yeah, how long will it last and how do, you, how do you actually hold on to it and what is it? Which is at the core of it, it's a big question. I think it's down to the two. I think it's down to Mike and Zoe, them sort of continuing what they're doing and loving what they're doing and growing what they're doing. And again, not being too corporate um, because that, I think that's when it, when it dies. If you kind of go into that route, then you'll lose it and people won't believe in it. So if they just continue, keep doing what they've been doing, slowly grow, slowly then perhaps then they can maintain that um yeah otherwise it, it would be interesting to see, the, see where they are in another couple of years time well hopefully we'll reconvene at that point <laughs> yeah. thank you everyone very much for joining me and i think we should just give a quick round of applause to mike and zoe for yet another beautiful collection yeah. <laughs>